Okay, so now let's just talk a little bit about excitation contraction coupling. And um, we're gonna start kind of changing gears a little bit. We're gonna talk about the hard cells first, the cardiac myocytes and how this process works. And then we'll go back to those vascular smooth muscles and, and go over those again. But basically for cardiac myocytes, what we have here, and I just wanna orient you a little bit. So this is gonna be the outside of the cell. So the extracellular space is all out here. And then the inside of the cell is gonna be all in here. So this is all inside the cell. This is all outside the cell. From the SA node, we originate an electrical impulse that travels down eventually to the ventricular myocytes. Okay, and so that depolarization is gonna come in here. So we have some depolarization that's coming in. Okay, so we have a depolarization that's coming in. That depolarization is going to activate, it's gonna go down through these T tubules, these transverse tubules, which are essentially uh, invaginations of the membrane wall here. And then you can see down here, we'll have some L-type calcium channel. So this depolarization comes through the tubule and then eventually it will reach this L-type calcium channel. This calcium channel will allow calcium to come into the cell. So I might have some calcium out here in the extracellular space, okay? That calcium will be allowed to come into the cell with depolarization. So this channel will open, allow calcium in. So that will increase my intracellular calcium levels. Okay, I'll put a little I there for intracellular. So that opening of the channel will increase the intracellular calcium ions. As these calcium ions come in, they're going to open this ryanidine receptor. This ryanidine receptor is basically receptive to the increase in calcium ions. It's kind of how I remember it, ryanidine receptive. It's receptive to the calcium that's coming in. And so as this calcium comes in, it basically says, okay, let's do this. Let's bind here and open this door up. And again, I'm just drawing this so it makes sense. This isn't exactly what happens you know, molecularly, but it's, that's the way to remember it. So this calcium makes this receptor receptive to opening. Okay, so that's why we call it calcium-induced calcium release because the calcium that's coming in is inducing this ryanidine receptor to open and subsequently release more calcium. And you might be saying, well, where does this calcium go? It goes from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is this box here. You can think of this as basically like a vault storing all the calcium in the cell. And once this initial calcium comes in, the floodgates open right? And all this calcium comes rushing out into the uh, cytosol. Okay, so then the intracellular calcium levels go way up. And all that calcium is eventually going to help promote contractions. Remember what I said, calcium is associated with contractions, particularly in cardiac myocytes, right? Muscle tissue in smooth muscle and skeletal muscle. Increased levels of calcium are associated with contractility. So we kick our calcium levels way up, and then what the calcium does is it binds to troponin C. And just to give you a very, you know, short depiction of this, because you know I'll talk a lot more about this in this in the muscle physiology video. But essentially, the troponin C, we'll just put TNC here, is blocking the cross bridge of myosin and actin, right? So there's all of this actin that is going to be here that the myosin head wants to bind to. Okay, so this is supposed to be your myosin head, right? And it wants to bind to this actin, but it can't bind to it because the troponin C is in the way. And so all of this increase in calcium will essentially bind and move this troponin C conformationally out of the way so that the myosin and the actin can get together and you can get cross bridge formation, sarcomere shortening, right? You get contractions. And we'll talk more about that portion, like I said, in the muscle physiology video, but I just want you to get an idea here. And so that's the general concept. So that's why when I increase my calcium levels, right, in cardiac myocytes, I can get contractility because it's moving the troponin C out of the way so that actin and myosin can interact together. So calcium causing contraction. Now, what happens, right, the heart beats and then it relaxes, right? We have systole diastole. So how do we go from a contraction to a relaxation in the heart? How do we get to the relaxation? Well, the major player here is going to be the circa, okay? The circa, so what does it stand for? Sarcoendoplasmic reticulum, right? That's this thing, calcium ATPase. It's this transporter right here. What it does is, remember, this is our vault storing all of our calcium. And, right, when we have a depolarization, we rush all that calcium out after the L-type calcium channel is open. But when we want to relax, we have to pump all that calcium back in so that troponin C can block myosin and actin cross bridge formation. So to do that, we have to pump calcium against its gradient. That's why it requires ATP. So I'm going to take the calcium from here and I'm just going to pump it 
back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And by doing that, by pumping all that calcium back in, now my calcium levels drop and troponin C will again block myosin. So circa is primarily responsible for that. Now, this is all in a cardiac myocyte, okay? How does that differ from the vascular smooth muscle that's surrounding blood vessels that we talked about initially? Well, it doesn't really differ by very much. In smooth muscle, we still have a depolarization, okay, that causes the L-type calcium channels to open. So that part's the same. We have calcium-induced calcium release. Now, one thing that's a little different if we're talking about vascular smooth muscle is that we can actually potentiate this, okay, or we can make this, um, you know, a more powerful vasoconstriction or contraction by doing a couple things. There's one particular GPCR that's really important to remember when we're talking about contractions or vasoconstriction. Okay, so I'm just going to draw a little circle here. This circle is going to represent my GPCR. Okay, so now again, we're pretending we're in vascular smooth muscle. This is going to be the GQ. Uh, protein. Now I'll talk about this in the next slide, but this GQ protein, when something binds to it, let's say, you know, one uh, drug target here would be norepinephrine. Okay, norepinephrine can bind to this GQ uh, protein, and it does this using alpha-1 receptors. Okay, so it can bind to an alpha-1 receptor, you know, go to this GQ protein, and that can eventually uh, create downstream two mediators. One of them is going to be diacylglycerol. Okay, that's particularly important to remember, and then IP3. Now, IP3 will go to the sarcoplasmic reticulum, our calcium vault, and it will knock on the door and say, calcium, come on out. So it's going to cause even more calcium to come out into the cytosol. And so IP3 will open the floodgates here and cause even more calcium to come out. Okay, and so it would increase the contraction of vascular smooth muscle, causing vasoconstriction, which is what norepinephrine does, right? Phenylephrine also does this. Okay, so that's how the process works molecularly correlating it to the big picture. Okay, so very similar. Now, what's different? What's different is that the calcium ions aren't binding to troponin C, they're binding to calmodulin, okay? And so this is a slightly different pathway in the vascular smooth muscle. So again, the calcium ions, they're gonna come in, and now my calcium ions, instead of binding tr to troponin C, they're gonna form a complex with calmodulin, okay? So they're going to form a complex with calmodulin, and then that complex is going to go on to stimulate myosin light chain kinase. And when you see a kinase, go back to your biochem, you're thinking about phosphorylating something, putting a phosphate group on. Now, four to five times when you put a phosphate group on, you're activating something. Okay, and this is another example of that. When in doubt, if you don't know, when you put a phosphate group on, usually you're activating something. So what are we activating here? So the myosin light chain kinase is going to put a phosphate group on myosin light chain, okay? And it's going to activate it by putting that phosphate group on there, okay? And by doing that, this will help increase the myosin and actin cross bridge formation like we talked about before. So that's the concept. So the calcium, instead of binding to troponin C to move it out of the way, binds to calmodulin, forms a complex, stimulates myosin light chain kinase to phosphorylate myosin light chain, which then goes on to help increase your cross bridge formation and increase contractility, which in the case of vascular smooth muscle, uh, if we're talking about blood vessels, right, it's gonna cause vasoconstriction. Now, just to add a little bit of a layer onto this, what happens when we want to relax in vascular smooth muscle? Well, I just want to dephosphorylate this guy, right? If I can take this phosphate off, then we can get through to relaxation. Okay, so myosin, light chain, phosphatase, right, a phosphatase will take a phosphate off, okay, so the myosin light chain phosphatase will take the phosphate off and get us back to our original myosin light chain, okay, and this would be associated with relaxation, okay, so this would be associated with relaxation, and again, what stimulates this pathway? What stimulates the vascular smooth muscle to relax? We already said what does this, right? This is cyclic GMP, which now it's all coming together, right? So the nitric oxide causes CGMP formation. CGMP stimulates myosin light chain phosphatase to dephosphorylate myosin light chain so that we get relaxation, vasodilation. So hopefully this isn't too overwhelming, but this is the, uh, the foundation. If you understand these pathways, 
You can take any molecule, you can take any drug target and you can plug it in, just see what it inhibits, what it does, and it will make complete sense. Okay, because there's really no exceptions. If you understand the pathway, you understand the rules of the game. Okay, and then the other thing I want to say here, and I'm not going to go into skeletal muscle too much here, just in the sake of time. We'll talk about that in the MSK videos. But there's two things I want to say. The first one is, in skeletal muscle, you know, it's different from like cardiac myocytes where we have automaticity. In cardiac myocytes, the SA node is sending electrical impulses at a regular rhythm, right? In a, in a physiologic situation, okay? It's going to be a regular rhythm. We're constantly sending impulses. We'll talk about this in the uh, electric physiology section. But in skeletal muscle, you need a neuromuscular junction and you need acetylcholine to stimulate your impulse. The other thing is there's no calcium-induced calcium release. The L-type calcium channels in skeletal muscle, instead of there being a gap here, where when one opens, it stimulates the opening of another, right? Instead, they're actually coupled together, okay? So it doesn't take calcium to stimulate the ranidine receptor. They're both going to be coupled and open together. The significance of that is, let's say you give somebody a calcium channel blocker, okay? A calcium channel blocker would block the L-type calcium channel, okay? Let's say verapamil in the cardiac myocyte. It's gonna block this channel. Well, if I block the L-type calcium channel, guess what? I'm gonna block everything downstream. So that's gonna have a profound effect on the contractility of my cardiac myocytes because I'm never really gonna open the ranidine receptor because I'm blocking the thing that allows the calcium to come in to open the ranidine receptor. I'm blocking the L-type calcium channel. So for that reason, calcium channel blockers don't really have a huge effect on skeletal muscle because the L-type calcium channel and ranidine receptor in skeletal muscle, they're connected basically, right? When one opens, the other one's gonna open. It doesn't take the calcium from here to open this one, okay? so. Really, again, if you understand the mechanisms, all these drugs actually make sense, and this is what you're usually tested on.